can we get ourselves assembled and then we can get started with the next panel? Great. Okay, well welcome back everyone. Thanks so much for, uh, for being here. So this panel is on genetic information and peoples and federal policy. Um, and I'm George Contreras. I teach intellectual property and property law here at uh, American University. And I'd like to introduce the members of my panel very quickly. Um, to my right is Pilar Osorio, who's a professor of law and bioethics at the University of Wisconsin Law School, who also has an appointment at the, uh, the medical school in Wisconsin. She's the ethics scholar in residence at the Moorage Institute for Research, in addition, which is a private, nonprofit research institute, part of the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery. And she also acts as the co-director of Wisconsin's Law and Neuroscience Program. And most importantly for today's uh, panel, she uh, was part of the team that represented the Havasupai Indian tribe in its uh, lawsuit against Arizona State University with respect to uh, research and genetics. Um, next is uh, Julia Paul, who is a 2009 alumna of the Washington College of Law. Um, graduated from, after graduating from here, she got an LLM in Indigenous Peoples Law and Policy at the University of Arizona. She's worked as a law clerk at the Native American Rights Fund and also for the Pasqua Yaqui Tribe. Um, and also relevant to today's panel, uh, Julia is a member and volunteer of FORCE, uh, which stands for Facing Our Risk of Cancer Empowered, a national nonprofit advocacy and support organization that focuses on hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. Um, then next we have Greg Dolan uh, from the University of Baltimore uh, Center for Medicine and Law, which he co-directs. It's a partnership between University of Baltimore Law School and Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Um, uh, prior to uh, that position, uh, Greg has had positions at George Washington University, Northwestern University, the law firm of Kramer Levin, um, and also uh, clerked for Pauline Newman on the U.S. Uh, Court of Appeal for the Federal Circuit and uh, Emory Widener on the Fourth Circuit. And then at the far end, uh, my colleague here at the Washington College of Law, Ezra Rosser, um, who teaches property, federal Indian law, property law, and housing law here. Um, he has uh, also taught at uh, Harvard University, Yale Law School, and Greg Sumatian University in Japan. He is currently chair of the American Association of Law School, Indian Nation, and Indigenous Peoples section and as a recipient of the Elizabeth A. Coverly Scholarship Award and the Emily C. Gossi Scholarship Awards here at Washington College of Law. So thank you very much to my panelists who have a great deal of expertise in these areas um, and hopefully we'll learn a lot from today. Um, so I'd like to kick it off by turning the microphone over to Pilar Osorio, who can give us an introduction to some of the disputes and issues that uh, revolve around the collection and usage of DNA and biological materials from indigenous people. Thank you, George, and it's a pleasure to be here. I'm not sure if this microphone is... Push the button. Ah, there we go. Wait, so they couldn't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so as I said, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I, I should also say that there's quite a lot that has been published on uh, genetics and genomics and um, research with Native Americans, with biological specimens from humans, with plant resources, etc. There is no way we have time to cover all of that today. So I'm going to try and focus um, on intellectual property issues more than on the sort of general issues of genetics and indigenous communities. Um, the second thing I want to say is I am not here representing any particular community or speaking on behalf of any particular community. Um, I'm here speaking through my experience as somebody who has worked with um, I worked with the Havasupai, as George said, uh, as an expert and advisor to the tribe and the tribe's council in their litigation. 
against the Arizona Board of Regents that I will talk a little bit about. I've also worked quite a lot with the Hopi in developing their research oversight capacities and with some other southwestern tribes. But I'm speaking from my personal perspective and not representing any community or tribe or whoever. All right. So when we're talking about genetics and intellectual property, we're primarily talking about, number one, patenting of cells, DNA, or other biological resources that are at least properly modified so they can be patentable subject matter. And then secondly, and of increasing importance, I think, is the issue of data sharing mandates from science funders. And again, I'm going to be talking mostly today about the research side issues as opposed to perhaps products that might arise out of genetics research or something like that. But I think most of the disputes and concerns that have been raised so far have arisen because of genetics research. So that's what I'm going to focus on. And federal funders, both in the United States and outside of the United States. Oh, I'm sorry. I need to find a way to switch. Yeah. Here we go. There we go. I have to remember to keep that up. So federal funders, both inside and outside of the United States, are increasingly requiring that scientists, particularly those doing some kind of genomics or other omics research, that they deposit their research data into data sharing repositories that can be used and reused by scientists from around the world. And that really comes into conflict with values of data privacy and control over data. And I think these values are particularly important among many indigenous communities where people have felt that secondary uses of their data and their biological specimens have, that that has gone on. It's gone on without their permission. It's gone on in ways that they feel redound to their detriment as opposed to their benefit. So in my experience, many indigenous communities are particularly concerned about secondary uses of data and specimens. And the push by funders for data sharing comes into direct conflict with that. So that raises questions of trade secrecy or some kind, I mean, basically trade secret law is the way that companies deal with issues of data privacy, data secrecy, the maintenance of data that is particular to that corporate entity and special to them. So patents and trade secrets are the two areas of intellectual property that I think are most relevant when we're talking about genetics. So just, I'm going to raise a couple of background issues. One is this tension between sort of patents as something that is contradictory in some way to some indigenous cultures' values and views about ownership and treatment of cells and bodily materials. And so patents may be viewed as a violation of some value in that regard. On the other hand, patents can also be a way, if properly licensed and the intellectual property rights are properly negotiated up front, they can also be a way that indigenous communities can share in any economic value that is generated from the research. So there's a kind of tension there between, on the one hand, wanting to reject the patenting of cells and DNA and so forth altogether, and on the other hand, perhaps saying, well, if we are going to accept patenting, then we want to have some license or some rights granted back to us from those patents. So that is one cluster of issues, I think, around intellectual property and genomics and so forth. Another cluster of issues, I think, just arises more generally out of concerns about research exploitation. And you will hear people from many different Native American communities around this country say things like, my community has either been victimized by researchers who did unconsented research on us or who 
did basically helicopter research where they came, they took biological materials, uh, they left, they traded those biological materials around with other researchers, they did research to, that we never authorized. Sometimes they did that research and made claims about us that are inconsistent with our uh, views of our origins and with others of our values. Um, so generally a concern that researchers have uh, perpetuated kinds of exploitation that have gone on for a long time. And where does IP fit into this? Well, um, the idea that IP sort of um, incentivizes this kind of research and permits research institutions and researchers to enrich themselves potentially in both reputation and money by taking something from indigenous communities. And so this empowers the researchers and in some cases, um, because of the claims of the research, may be viewed as disempowering indigenous communities. So I think there is a way in which patents in particular are viewed as um, part of a larger framework of potential exploitation. Um, and then I sort of mentioned this already, but the data sharing issues where um, funds are increasingly requiring it. And yet, again, this is part of concerns about loss of control over the use of data and the kinds of claims that are made about us as a community, about indigenous communities, right? Um, and I think as I get into the story of the Havasupai a little bit, you'll see in more specificity why communities might be concerned about the sorts of claims that are made. One of the issues with research ethics generally in this country is that it is very much focused on individual, the, the rights and the, the um, interest of individual research participants. There is nothing formal that has to do with protecting the interests of the community. And yet if you are a federally recognized tribe um, with tribal lands under your jurisdiction, claims about your community can impact your entire, you know, people who didn't participate in the research might still be deeply impacted and affected by it. Um, and so, there's a mismatch there between the way that the tribes often look at the implications of research and the way the federal regulations um, govern research. So to talk a little bit more about that mismatch, thanks. <laughs> I'm going to talk for just a minute about uh, the Havasupai case. There's a fair amount that has been written about this case. Much of it, I think, is not correct, um, or at least it's incomplete. And I would urge you, if you are interested, um, to look for the Hart Report. So there was um, an independent investigation that was conducted. It was done by a lawyer and private investigator who were agreed upon by ASU and um, by the Havasupai. Um, the, that investigation took around a year. The report is quite long. It involved many, many interviews. You can get access to this report if you can't find a copy of it on the web. Uh, you can contact the tribe or the tribe's lawyers and they're happy to send out a copy of the report. Um, that report is the most thorough explication of what occurred. And the facts as set forth in that report were essentially not disputed in the litigation. So from my point of view, it was actually very interesting to be an advisor in this litigation because um, it wasn't a litigation at all really about the facts. It was about the law and what the law should be in a context that where there really was no precedent. Um, and so the first thing I want to do is just show you a little bit about um, these are photos that I took when I went to uh, Supai Village in 2006, I believe. So this litigation um, started in 2003 and was settled in 2010. Um, but this is just to show you a little bit. The Havasupai are a very small tribe. There are a few, it's about 600 enrolled members, maybe a few more, about 400 of whom live in Supai. 
So this is next slide. What you see as you and and there are no roads leading down there. The only way to get down there is either to hike or to go by like horse or mule or to go by helicopter. And so when you're going there as a lawyer, you go by helicopter. Because hiking down there in your pubs would be it's like an eight mile hike down into the canyon that is connected to the Grand Canyon. So not the kind of thing you do with your briefcase and your pumps. All right. So this is what Supai looked like, a little bit of what Supai looked like when I went there in 2006. The per capita income in 2003 when the litigation started was about $3,000 per adult member of the tribe. One of the shocking things to me being a participant in this litigation was the really the amount of explicit racism that I heard articulated at various points and by various people along the way, including certain lawyers with whom I interacted as part of this litigation. But one of the things I heard a lot from sort of random people was, well, all the tribes are rich. I'm like, you know, tribes are not a homogeneous group by any means. There is a lot of diversity of views within tribes and between tribes. And there is also a lot of diversity with respect to income. And the Havasupai are not a tribe that has anything to do with gambling, and they are definitely not rich. This is actually Carlita Tolosi, who was the lead plaintiff. All right, so I just want to tell you, I'm going to really condense this because we have a whole panel. So I'm just going to tell you really what led to the complaint, which was research that was conducted by researchers from the University of Arizona, or Arizona State University, and who then moved to the University of Arizona, who represented their research project to the Tribal Council as a diabetes genetics research project. The council voted to allow a diabetes project. This is how we understood the case, basically, and what gave rise to the complaint. The council voted to allow a diabetes project, and the council was very interested. There is a very, very high burden of diabetes in this tribe. So almost 50% of the adult women have been diagnosed with diabetes, and about 30% of the adult men. So diabetes is an enormous problem, and people were very enthusiastic about a diabetes research project. And I just also want to say that this is a good point to stop and remind people that although in many tribes there are many concerns about research, it is not as though indigenous communities just reject research or have no interest in it. Many have a deep interest in it, and they certainly have deep health needs that ought to be addressed by the research and medical communities. And diabetes in the Havasupai tribe is one of those concerns. Individual participants gave consent to participate with the understanding that they were participating in a diabetes research project, but the researchers knew from the start that they intended to do several other kinds of research, including and particularly research into schizophrenia genetics and research into inbreeding in the tribe and the effects of inbreeding. And in fact, there was a paper published in the scientific literature on inbreeding in the tribe, and there was at least one PhD project done on schizophrenia genetics. So this brings me to my point of tribes being concerned about how research can be framed in ways that is detrimental to them and why they particularly care as a collective about things like unauthorized secondary research. Because a claim made by researchers that there is a particularly high rate of schizophrenia in this tribe or that there is a high rate of inbreeding in this tribe can stigmatize every single member of the tribe, whether or not that person participated in the research. So I just wanted to make the point that this is not a situation in which specimens were collected for one purpose and then later used in secondary research as new ideas came up or new scientific problems arose. That is the more traditional situation. And that is the way the issue here was framed in many of the news reports and in the scientific press. But that is not what we alleged happened. 
because what we alleged happened was essentially fraud. They, the researchers, one in particular, knew that she intended to do genetics of schizophrenia and inbreeding from the start and did not make that clear when she was collecting specimens and data. All right. And I'm actually just going to skip that slide. So we're going to go right to the next slide. All right. So I want to say something about the lawsuit. But the claims that were pressed throughout the entire seven years that this suit was active were negligent research, negligent research oversight, and negligent infliction of emotional distress. So the type of property claims that one has seen in other lawsuits having to do with research, unconsented research uses or patents arising from those research uses, the types of claims such as conversion, early on, very early when the suit was first filed, there was a conversion claim. There were also civil rights claims. Those claims were dropped. The conversion claims were dropped in part because I thought that they were unlikely to succeed and that they were, as a matter of litigation strategy, likely to generate a lot of opposition from the scientific community, and we didn't need them. This was a case in which the negligence and fraud type of claims would stand us in good stead. The civil rights violation claims were dropped for other reasons. Also, the defendants, so there were defendants other than the Arizona defendants initially. And in particular, the Arizona defendants were scientists who had collected the blood and done research, but they had also given specimens to many other researchers around the world, including researchers at Stanford, researchers in the U.K., researchers at Roche, and some of those researchers had obtained patents. But when we tried to track down the relationship between the tribe's cells and DNA and the resulting patents, we felt that it wasn't really possible to make a direct connection to understand whether any of the tribe's material was used in the research that gave rise to the patents or not. And even if we could prove that, you know, some of the tribe's specimens had been used in that research, many, many other specimens had been used in that research as well. So it just wasn't clear that we really had any legal claims arising out of the fact that people had conducted secondary research and obtained patents, all without the knowledge or consent of the tribe. And even though that was experienced as a deep dignitary harm and violation, we didn't really see any legal rights there to enforce, and there were other strategic reasons to drop those defendants. So the suit settled, and having gone through four courts, having cost the Arizona Board of Regents over a million dollars, the settlement involved blood and blood derivatives such as cell lines being returned to the tribe where there was a repatriation ceremony and a burial. The university president of ASU grudgingly apologized. We also developed several collaborations between the tribe and several of the different Arizona universities. So I'm just going to just have these go up on the screen, right, and we can talk about this if you're interested. Also as part of the settlement were 30 university scholarships and five graduate school scholarships. These are full scholarships for tribal members, including living expenses and book expenses and so forth, to be available over the next 30 years because there are not that many members of this tribe who have even got through high school yet. So one of the things was building a new high school that would be accessible to members of the tribe. And then there was some money for individual plaintiffs. So what I want to say, the upshot of this litigation with respect to IP, is that I think tribes are very unlikely under the present system to have claims 
that they will win on that arise out of the fact that somebody patents a cell line or something like that deriving from members of the tribe. What tribes need to do is they need to know up front about things like BIDL and the IP policies of the institutions that are proposing to conduct research within their jurisdictions, and they need to negotiate about rights coming back, or they need to decide that because things arising out of research can be patented, if we decide collectively that that's not consistent with our, our tribe's values, then we don't participate in that research. Or we find ways of doing privately funded research, which some tribes have done. Um, the next thing is that tribes need to know about the data sharing requirements of funders. They need to negotiate. Some tribes have negotiated directly with research funders um, to make sure that the blanket data sharing policies do not apply to research that involves their data. But the funders, even within the National Institutes of Health, the science funders vary with respect to the uh, degree to which they will accommodate the tribe's interests. So all of which is to say, um, I think there's been a lot of growth and sophistication among many tribes with respect to things like writing memoranda of understanding with researchers who are going to come into their community. Um, tribes, to the extent that researchers want to come within the tribe's jur legal jurisdiction to do research, the tribes get to say yes or no. You can come into our jurisdiction or not, just as countries get to say that person from outside of our country can come in or not. Um, and so these things need to get negotiated up front before researchers set foot um, within the tribe's jurisdiction is my take home message. And the intellectual property issues need to get worked out um, in agreements that are consistent with federal and state law, but that reflect the tribe's values and interests. And I'll stop with that. <clears throat> Pilar, thanks so much. Um, Julia, would you give us some of your perspectives uh, relating to genetics and tribes? Sure. Um, so first, I have to say, too, um, although I am a member of FORCE, um, I am not here speaking on their behalf, um, but I'm here as a stakeholder, um, as a member of the community uh, that uh, works on uh, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. Um, and I think there are a lot of parallels between what is going on in that community and that movement to what is going on in um, these issues in, in Indian country. Um, so I want to start with um, a sort of an overarching framework of there's the old adage of knowledge is power. And I think that having gone to law school and studied critical race, I think what is a more valuable framework to work from is what is the knowledge and who has the power and who has the knowledge and what is the power. And in a broader scheme, um, critical race theory has informed a lot of what I've done in indigenous, in my indigenous studies um, and my, my own um, thoughts about all of these issues. Um, in critical race, intersection of race, law, power, um, and it's driven very much by <coughs> storytelling and personal narratives. Um, if you've never heard of it, uh, I encourage you to look up um, articles by Lawrence Blum and Rob Williams. Rob Williams um, taught at the University of Arizona um, program where I was a student. And what I want to start with is in terms of, is specific to the implications of genetic testing. This is what George told me to talk about. And I went to law school, so I followed the direction. Um, and I want to talk with it, start with the, the idea of who are the stakeholders. Um, Angelina Jolie did a great service by writing her article in New York Times, which raised a level of awareness about hereditary breast and ovarian cancer to one that has never existed before. My personal genetic counselor told me in the two months after 
Angelina Jolie's article came out, she literally ran out of business cards because so many people were coming in and wanting information. So the stakeholders in the BRCA community, breast cancer, positive mutation, are the people who carry the mutation, the scientists who are working on the situation, the lawyers who litigate in a case like Myriad Genetics, and George is writing a book on the Myriad Genetics case about patenting the BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. They're the family members of people who carry the gene. And so there are individuals and there are more collective communities. And within indigenous law, one of the things we talk about all the time are individual versus collective rights. Pilar talked about this earlier, and I think it is a framework that is very, very helpful. Because when you talk about the implications of genetic testing, you're talking about what are the risks and the benefits for anybody who is trying to find out information. So benefits to researchers, they have something to work on. They're helping move health research forward. Benefits to people who have a cancer diagnosis. There's hope for treatment. There's hope for further generations to have treatment or more information so that they can make better decisions about their care. But there's also a collective community. And force, again, facing our risk of cancer empowered, is a collective community of women and men. So I want to be very clear that men do get breast cancer and can carry the mutation, who are trying to work within the community, work within the research bases that have been set up by a lot of universities to help in the research by giving genetic samples with the understanding that there is a potential benefit to future generations. Now, some of this is massive data bank collection, which Pilar talks about, and the importance of these repositories in terms of data sharing and data privacy. I can tell you that two places where I have contacted to see if I could help somehow in the research, send you consent forms that are super thick, ask you to go to your doctor's office and, you know, please fill these three blood vials. Okay, but they send five blood vials. So I don't know. So it's informed consent and it's consent. So what I'm trying to say is your blood goes out and you don't necessarily know what's going to happen. And Pilar talks about the importance of secondary research, that there are things that evolve naturally from these studies. Do you think that as a stakeholder you will ever find out that information? Sure, they tell you, you know, you might get some good news, you might get some bad news. But it's basically Dana-Farber has a repository for hereditary cancer. They want to get 10,000 families into this, okay? Great cutting-edge research. But one of the risks of that and an implication of genetic testing is, are you going to find out something absolutely horrible? Are you going to find out that you will likely die of something in the next 10 years? Are you going to find out something about your children, something about your grandparents? And so as an individual, to make that informed consent decision, in my opinion, is very, very difficult. Now, if you're under pressure of a diagnosis, it becomes even more difficult. The thing that I think is really important to think about is this knowledge and power. And 
to build a little bit on um, what Suzanne has worked so very hard on, NAGPRA, Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, um, is the notion of this opposition between scientists and stakeholder communities. And I think by way of example, one of the most powerful ones, very briefly, is the story of Kennewick Man, as he is known in the scientist world, or the ancient one, as he is known, known among a group of tribes. Um, Kennewick Man was found in Washington in the early 90s. He is, um, to this day, one of the oldest full set of human remains that have been located in North America. Um, and there's a line of cases and just an incredible amount of litigation over the set of remains, which had to do with power and control. In the United States, there is no property right in a dead body. But somebody had to keep him somewhere, and somebody had to decide what to do with him. Now, the Smithsonian was called in to help with dealing with the set of remains, and the Bonnickson line of cases, it's B-O-N-N-I-C-H-S-E-N, um, named for one of the, the lead scientists in this. Um, the argument was scientists want to know where this man came from. And one of the arguments that was set up by the Umatilla tribe was that um, we don't know where he, we don't know, need to know where he came from because we know where we came from diametrically opposed to the science, right? It's because they knew that they had their creation stories and their traditional knowledge base to inform what they felt was a member of their community, an ancestor. And for me, that's a very powerful notion. They knew they had the knowledge that worked for them. And here was an outside force coming in trying to gain power and control over a set of remains with a different agenda. And I think these issues have to be treated with a tremendous amount of caution because these are people, just like people within the breast cancer and ovarian community, have the immediate need of, do I need treatment? What are you going to do with that sample that you cut out of my body or you take from my blood? And what's going to happen to it? And how is it going to be used? Um, so I think basically you have to really differentiate between the goals, what is the knowledge that, that people want, and what is the knowledge that people have. In the breast cancer community, people want to know that their sons and daughters are not going to have to face the future with a 50 to 87 percent chance of developing cancers. And I should also say, because I like to inform people about the breast and ovarian cancer community, um, the, the genes that have these two mutations, BRCA1 and BRCA2, that you hear about all the time, there are also links to melanoma, pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, testicular cancer. So the implications are far broader. And this is some of the secondary research that will come out of people giving their genetic data to these huge data banks. But the stakeholders don't necessarily have any say. And I think that looking at the BRCA community and looking at indigenous communities and these massive studies that are going on, data privacy and data sharing is really important. In Myriad, the Supreme Court said, no, you can't patent the gene, right? But you can patent the scientific manipulation, the, was it the SRNA strand? Mm -hmm. mRNA. This, thank you. OK. But so part of somebody, right? And, and the thing is, the breast cancer genes, everybody has them. The breast, they're, they're tumor suppressor genes, OK? You all have. BRCA1 and BRCA2, okay? It's whether you have a mutation in them or not. And it's getting a lot 
of media at this point and people are listening and i think another thing to think about is why is this taking suzanne's work why is it taking decades and decades to do something so simple as to stop using a slur to describe the washington sports team you have to keep talking about it. you have to keep the conversation going so that's that's what i have to say thanks Julia, thank you so much. Um, that, that's great. That's great. Uh, Greg Dolan, do you want to make any comments? And uh, I'm lucky in a sense because George told me that I can just take pot shots. So that's, that's always fun. Um, so I come, and perhaps this is sort of where I come from uh, myself. Uh, I approach it with somewhat discussing some with some skepticism towards not a rejection but skepticism towards the communitarian perspective um, and so let me just go through some of the things that were presented today and um, uh, just talk about sort of how and why my skepticism arises and um, the potential problems with uh, with either communitarian perspective but also with uh, the the potential of solutions that were presented. And let me also, I suppose, begin with a story, um, uh, and I'll preface it by saying it's not my story, so I'm, I'm appropriating somebody's IP, but be, be it as it is, uh, so be it. Uh, those of you who have had a chance to read, uh, I think, a wonderful book called The Immoral Life of Henrietta Lacks, so it's a great book, but it, uh, and at the, sort of, at the epilogue, it has um, the author uh, of the book sort of suggests that you know we should do a better job getting consent because part of the problem or perhaps the major problem is to what happened to Henrietta Lacks. And those of you who have not read the book, she's essential. she was an African-American woman in, I believe, the 50s, right? She died in the mid-50s. Uh, uh, she died at Johns Hopkins Hospital that at the time was still segregated. Uh, it was, you know, it was one of the hospitals in below me, Nixon line that actually did treat uh, 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 African Americans and poor uh, patients. That was part of the mission of the hospital, was, you know, as originally set up by uh, Mr. Hopkins. Uh, but it was still segregated. It was still sort of, um, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a southern institution. Uh, and she was dying of cervical cancer, and some of her cells were collected, uh, in part because this was sort of the most aggressive cancer that the doctors had ever seen. And as a, because of that, uh, the, her cells end up being the first sort of immortal stem line, uh, not stem line, immor immortal uh, line uh, uh, that sort of, uh, uh, that allowed physicians sort of to both look at cancer and other diseases. And in fact, a lot of the cell lines that are still being used in the scientific community are descendants of the original HeLa cells. Um, but again, because it was not physically, because she was African American, because she was poor, because it was sort of just that was the way things were done. Nobody consented to, to, you know, nobody asked her consent to get her cells, to use her cells, or anything of, of that sort. And based on the way that she was described to the, to the author of the book by her children and people who knew her, uh, they said, well, had she been asked, of course she would have said yes. She knew she was dying, and she was the type of person who would have said yes to help other people when she could no longer help herself. Um, and so certainly she was treated poorly, but here's the thing. At the epilogue, the author suggested, well, we should do more consent, and yet she also points out that how consent is not perhaps always the answer, and uh, here's why. We still have some samples in, very, in the CDC, uh, or I guess at the, the National Institute of Medicine, or wherever but they're actually stored, of uh, blood work and other tissues from soldiers from World War I or around World War I who were stricken with influenza, so the famous influenza of 1919 that killed millions of people both here and in Europe. Um, obviously when those soldiers, whether or not they were as consent is, for the purpose of the discussion, not quite the truth because when they were, had, if they, even assuming that they were as proper consent back then, certainly they could not, could not have consented to DNA research on the virus materials that is in their blood cells because who knew about DNA in 1919? And so even assuming that, they, uh, that we got consent from those individuals, you know, how far does that consent go? Certainly you can have consent that says, I can like consent for any type of research at any time for any purpose. For but usually courts 
view that those types of blanket consents are as not being sufficiently informed consent, right? So ultimately, I think the question is about the secondary type of research. Should we get more consent? Should we, uh, you know, should we be more careful? I guess in some ways the answer is yes. We certainly, you know, I certainly don't want to sit here and condone going into uh, Native American land and knowing that you're going to do something different than what you say and sort of committing fraud up front. But I do also want to question as to how useful getting to a broader consent because what we know today and what we're going to know in 10 years and the things that we can do today and things we're going to do in 10 years are, could potentially be very, very different worlds. I mean, if you just think about what we did and what the level of science and state of the art in not that long ago, you know, in my lifetime and in, uh, in, in the mid-80s and what we know now, um, it's, just, it's just two different worlds. Along the same, uh, the flip side, or the flip side of that though is, and this is getting to my the communitarian issue is, DNA is different. Um, it's not fingerprints. It's not, you know, it's not just blood type. It's different because those of you who've either participated or at least heard about websites like Twenty Three and Me and other websites. Uh, one of the, the premises of those uh, of those organizations, right, is that you send them uh, your cheek swap, and they don't only tell you your uh, you know your racial composition or whatever else that they tell you, but a lot of them say like, and here's you know your second cousin twice removed because you know they've sent their cheek swab a while you know uh, a while ago, and we're building this sort of it's kind of such as like ancestry.com but DNA based, um, and you know, that's kind of cool, uh, but it's also kind of, uh, you know, perhaps scary. And uh, I guess the question is, and again, this is me sort of uh, stealing somebody else's ideas, but uh, my university just hired a new, a new faculty member to start in July. We're very excited about her. But she, her job talk was about this issue that when you give DNA and when you give consent, you don't just disclose information about yourself, you disclose information about your parents, your siblings, your grandparents, and I mean at some point it becomes, the relation becomes sufficiently tenuous that it's not as much different between you and a stranger, but it's not just you. And so there is this tension between um, individual approach and the community base. I mean, and then the question is like, well, how do we define community? Is it a tribe? Is it a family? Is it, a, is it an extended family? Is it... You know, and we can so we, we can start drawing this line and uh, and and, uh, 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 and chop it up any which way we like, but you know we do have to recognize that. And if we are to move towards sort of the more communitarian approach, and I think a lot of very difficult questions come up as to who has the right of veto, who you know, if it's it's one thing to say that, for example, that a tribe has control over its territory and can say, look, unless you tell us, you know, honestly what are you going to be doing and unless you know, we decided that's something worthwhile for our tribe, you can't come in or, you know, unless you should we agree some sort of profit share, whatever it is, whatever the, that's one thing, but it's somewhat different, I mean, uh, somewhat different to say that if the tribe says no, then no individual, no member of the tribe can sort of go off the territory to Arizona State University and say, well, I don't care what my older said, I'm going to do it anyways, right? And if they do it, and if we have sufficient number of people doing it, you're still revealing information about the tribe, assuming if they're sufficiently close to the related. And, yeah, you know, I, at least I would be somewhat uncomfortable saying that the individuals in the tribe or in the family or in some sort of insular communities, like for example, like Satmar Hasidim in New York, should be somehow bound by the decision of the community council, the elders or whoever, or, you know, the parents of, of, of the family. So, uh, I guess for me, on at least on that issue, the bottom line is yes, non participants are affected um, because by giving genetic information, your genetic information, you very well might disclose information about not um, uh, not participants or non participants, but um, I'm not sure so where that gets us in terms of whether or not participants should have any, um, any sort of a veto. Um, I guess one last point that I wanted to make is um, about profit sharing. And, uh, you know, I'm a capitalist. I, I like profit sharing. If, you know, if, if everybody sort of benefits, if that's the, that's the way to move the science and technology forward, that's great. 
But again, I sort of, and I, this sort of ultimately circles back to where I started as to question, well, how do we, you know, how do we write agreements in a way that sort of uh, encapsulates, in, in a way that sort of that captures the possibilities? Is the agreement supposed to last, you know, for anything you discover in the next 10 years, in the next 100 years and forever, or with any specific, you know, if you say, look, we, we only go to explore diabetes now, does it cover any discoveries in diabetes? Does it cover discoveries for the secondary research? Again, fraud aside, or upfront fraud aside. Um, I, I'm not a contracts person. I didn't, you know, I didn't do that on contracts in law school either. So maybe there are ways around it. Uh, maybe there are ways to draft comprehensive contracts that would allow, uh, that allow profit sharing. But it seems to me that given the fact that science expands exponentially and in a variety of different directions, that we really don't know what kind of discoveries are going to be possible tomorrow from those large data banks. This means it's going to be exceedingly hard to draft those contracts. I may be wrong. Maybe a contract person can correct it. But it seems to me that that's um, that that's uh, hard. And the final point on that, and again, so I don't want to be personally skeptical of you know uh, profit sharing, especially with communities who are providing some sort of uh, knowledge and information and uh, raw materials, as it were is that in sort of, after Myriad, which I think was wrongly decided, um, but there's this notion, right? I mean, I think it's part of the argument, um, uh, part of the argument of the challenges of the genetic material, of the genetic, genetic patents in Myriad was that if all you're doing is just contributing things that already exist in nature, you're really not you, you, you don't really do anything useful for us to give you monopoly rights and therefore to uh, get profits. It seems somewhat odd to say, but if the community does it, right, that they, then um, they should get uh, a profit sharing. Now, I think ultimately they probably should have that, again, if that advances so the goal of science and research, that makes people more willing to share uh, their materials, if, that, if that's sufficient to sort of entice people, I'm all for um, you know, I'm, I'm all for paying uh, people to, um, uh, to, uh, to donate uh, to, do, to donate their cells or blood or whatever else. Um, but it's, uh, I, I think it's probably intellectual property lens is perhaps not the best lens to think of it through. I think it's maybe more, should be thought of more as a in the same way that we pay people to donate their blood, we don't pay a lot, we pay something, or donate their eggs, we pay more, donate their sperm, we pay less, right? So, uh, and somewhere in between. Um, but I'm not quite sure that IP lens quite works in, in, in part because of what the Supreme Court said in Marion. So I think I'll stop here. Very good. Um, Ezra, oh, Ezra's got some slides. Yeah, and can you give me the clicker? Yep, the clicker right here. Thanks. Uh, thank you. So I'm going to uh, say a little bit, um, I was a little nervous at the first two presentations because I didn't know what to say. Uh, I am not an IP expert and realistically uh, don't know much about much of what the first two people talked about. Uh, that being said, uh, the third helped me a lot. Uh, so uh, you're, uh, that, that was good for me. Uh, so uh, I want to start with one of the things that where we agree, and I think one of the challenges that we don't talk about too often uh, is the potential disputes between Indian tribes and individual members on their perspectives on such things as genetic testing. Uh, one of the challenges um, uh, can be everything from modern, uh, whether some you know were educated off reservation and some on reservation. How much traditional knowledge uh, can be spread across the community and have different perspectives. Uh, two quick anecdotes that I think illustrate this. Uh, my father teaches on the Navajo reservation. He's white, uh, and his first couple um, days there, he or first couple years there, he used to take them to this museum. It was for Anasazi, and it was a cool museum. It was about people that the Navajos do care about. Uh, but they had a body on display in the thing, and it was in the kids' exhibit. And the kids were designed to go play in the sand as they picked out bones that were human bones. Uh, 
and uh, kids would leave running and screaming from this museum because of this exhibit. Uh, now, as soon as my dad found that, he no longer took the kids to this museum, but uh, that's the sort of problem of one perspective on science versus another. And uh, a counter story is my uh, his wife, who's a Navajo woman, uh, she was taken away to BIA schools, and uh, one of the assignments was a standard dissect something. Uh, and different Navajos had different perspectives on it. Some would dissect the frog, and others would not. Uh, those who did not dissect the frog uh, were allowed to dissect the frog, and she actually enjoyed dissecting the frog. Uh, there were uh, different takes on that. I think one of the issues that does come across uh, in all of this is that sometimes uh, the tribal voice can be, there can be multiple tribal voices. That being said, I think one counter to what we just heard is I think it's important to, one of those voices is very important, and it's different, I would classify it differently, and that is it's a tribal government. Uh, so it's not just an elder, it's not just a random group of people. They are governments that are recognized as sovereign, and as such should be treated uh, with uh, recognition of that status, even though their sovereignty is not something that we're comfortable with or know of. Uh, so let me go back then to the start. My talk is on reasons for concern. Uh, and my basic point is that tribes have lots of reasons to be very concerned uh, and to say that they are you know, just doing this because they either don't understand it or uh, want to um, block it uh, or have a different perspective on science, I think undermines these very real reasons. And so uh, just as a personal thing, uh, I am not Indian, uh, and my, what Navajos call non-Indians I think is great in this context. They say that non-Indians are Bilaganas, and Bilagana can translate as uh, white, the other, so you can actually be non-white, but uh, so blacks on the reservation can be Bilagana, uh, though generally it's white people. Uh, and the last one is the enemy, and I think that last one is a great part of the definition, and it's fairly accurate. Uh, and to get us there, uh, uh, Vine Deloria has a lot to say on this topic, um, and I'm just glad no one said his name yet, uh, because then I have material. Uh, but in Custer Died for Your Sins, uh, he wrote a chapter about anthropologists and other friends, which we could now reclassify as geneticists and other friends, right? People that go to the reservation seemingly with a good message, but really they're going to do harm. Uh, and I think this is a valuable perspective. And I think they even go to the reservation with positive intention. Uh, but the impact on the community can be very negative. Uh, and Custer, uh, sorry. Uh, if you haven't read the book, it's awesome, and it's also very funny. Uh, and um, I would say it's very funny to most audiences if you know just a little bit about Indians. And if you don't know much, you may not get the humor. Uh, uh, so here's uh, what I wanted to talk about, some of the knowledge. Uh, this is the seal in Navajo Nation. Almost all my examples are Navajo. Uh, but the seal has four sacred mountains on it. Uh, and Navajo beliefs are about these four sacred mountains, their traditional land. Uh, and a recent, another case that uh, is not about genetics, but uh, on the mountain that is black in this depiction, uh, they decided to spray septic, system, uh, septic water on this uh, mountain uh, to, re to add snow to it. Uh, and uh, what's great here is that Navajos came up with, a Navajos and other tribes came up with a great theory on this. The first part's obvious. You don't want uh, poop. Uh, septic water being sprayed on your sacred site, right? But the other one that's more relevant here is you also don't want body parts sprayed on your mountain. And they put that in the brief. And I, for the life of me, could not have come up with body parts. Well, they're there. And they, the example they used is mortuary runoff. Uh, and that's a thing that as an outsider, I just would not have seen. Uh, but for them, it was very real. Um, uh, so I think there's lots of reasons for concern. Here's an uh, older version. This is somewhat ripping off on work that people like Suzanne have done for their entire career. Uh, but this is, uh, not, uh, we see here, I think, the soldier at Bosque Redondo uh, keeping Indians after the long walk uh, and negotiating what became a settlement that became the tribe. Uh, uh, and that looks pretty dated, right? The photo looks pretty dated. Uh, but we don't have to think that far in uh, the past to think of less dated examples of how we see Indians. Uh, 
And even though uh, Gober came out and said, well, the movie does make him seem ridiculous, uh, therefore it's, the movie's not so bad, he did point out that the Legos about it are pretty bad. Uh, and I actually thought the movie was pretty bad, too. Uh, so uh, that's not that dated. Another example, uh, here's a novel rug. Some of you are familiar with this best example. Uh, no, Vicky's not in the room right now. Uh, but that looks very nice. Uh, the next thing is uh, a use of it uh, and how we use traditional knowledge. Uh, and my wife's uh, big task is going around. She used to send me photos from her iPhone of non-Indians wearing Indian patterns. Uh, but you can't do that anymore. They're everywhere. Uh, it would flood me. Uh, the number of uh, yoga pants or tight leggings on women with Navajo rugs is just ubiquitous. Uh, so I think it's good to go back to uh, a couple big points. One is tribes are sovereign. Uh, and so uh, I think we haven't really said that. But it needs to be said anytime we talk about tribes and their interests. Uh, this is a, a summary of those powers, and it still holds fairly, uh, fairly true. Um, and the other thing that's related to this is to have some uh, uh, self-doubt about how much we know. And so to get to uh, some of this self-doubt, or things we don't understand. And so let me say a couple of thoughts about this. One is, I don't understand Navajo belief structures, period. I don't get it. I don't, uh, I'm not Navajo. I don't understand their five-world system. I've heard it many times. I still don't understand it, and I probably will never understand it. Uh, but that doesn't mean there's not truth in it. And the same is true, I will say, as an uh, offensive aside, I don't understand Christians either. Uh, and I've heard a lot about Christianity over my life, uh, but their belief structure is similarly mind-boggling to me. Uh, and uh, yet we accept one, but not the other. Right? Uh, and another example uh, is we, I don't think we have an idea of what makes a good society, and we project that on the world. And one of those good society things is the scientific testing and uh, advancing science in our way. Uh, and yet, I'm not at all convinced that our society is better than lots of other societies. Uh, and to end, let me show uh, this book, uh, which is Charles Wilkinson. He ends his book, I think, in a great way by saying, uh, and I think it's in line with this humility point, uh, tribes have been around a really long time and they have been able to survive uh, a lot of really bad genocidal acts towards them. Uh, and so I think if they are skeptical towards non-Indians, even non-Indians doing good things through science, uh, it's a very well-justified skepticism, uh, and that we should give more credence to uh, their survivability and viability over very harsh circumstances. So I will stop there. Okay. Thank, thanks very much. Well, I throughout these uh, presentations, I've seen the other panelists like furiously scribbling, and uh, I think we want to have a conversation here. Um, Pilar, I see you've got a lot of notes. On the Do you have any responses? Um, well, I first thing is that there's one thing that we didn't cover explicitly, which uh, has to do with the fact that the genealogy companies are now in the big business of um, selling... Sorry, could, could you stop that with the headset there? Stop. Stop that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> are, are now in the business of selling uh, genetic testing to tribes as a way to define who is a member and who is not a member of a tribe. This has created... Um, a variety of concerns in particular tribes. It has been seen as a way of excluding people from tribes, particularly when there is uh, money to be distributed among members of tribes. So, um, I, you know, a whole talk could be done on this. Many people have been done on this. I just, uh, many people have been working on this. I would commend the work of Kim Talbert, uh, who is at Berkeley who used to work in tribal enrollment before she went into academia, and she has written on this a lot. So I just want to raise that as a huge issue in sort of a huge genetics issue uh, that is very pertinent to the tribes. Um, another thing that we didn't really talk about so explicitly, but we kind of touched on it, has to do with um, beliefs and origins. So the first thing I want to say, um, I, I love the point about humility. Um, I also think it's important to say that 
you know, there are a lot of different beliefs within any tribe, just as there are different beliefs among Christians. But one of the ways in which genetics tends to butt up against at least some people's beliefs within the tribes is that geneticists are big on trying to say where people came from, right? And it's increasingly an intrinsic part of doing large whole genome studies of people is that you parse them out according to ancestral background in order to be able to genetically detectable, I want to say this, genetically detectable ancestral background in order to be able to answer the scientific questions. And so as kind of almost a side effect of doing the studies, geneticists have information that they will often report where they talk about how populations are related to each other and where they came from. And that, at least according to geneticists' worldviews. I actually think it's a really interesting exercise to think about how geneticists' explanations of where people came from can be consistent with tribes' understandings, traditional understandings of where they came from. After all, what does it mean to become people, right? And I think there's a lot of parallel here between people who are sort of, who take the Bible literally versus people who don't, for instance, in terms of their origins and their origin, their understandings of origins. And there are people within tribes who understand origin, the tribe's origin stories and concepts in a more metaphorical way, and there are people who understand them more literally. But this is one aspect of genetics that a lot of tribes are very sensitive to, and some scientists, a few, have actually agreed, okay, if I do genetics with a particular tribal group, I will not make any claims about this. I won't even, some scientists have gone so far as to say, I won't really look at those data so that I can't make real claims about that, even though they're there and I need them for certain purposes, but I won't analyze them in certain ways, and I will not make claims about them, and about sort of relatedness of members of this tribe to other groups of people. So again, it's a matter of negotiating up front and deciding if your group wants to engage in some genetic research with some particular researcher, what can you negotiate with them? Oh, on the last point, I don't know how, I guess, I don't know how comfortable I am with negotiations that involve putting limits on scientists sort of making claims within the current acceptable scientific methods. If those claims are inconsistent with the way the research subjects view themselves, either as individuals or as members of a larger community. That seems to me to be, I mean, I think it's one thing to sort of withhold consent to a particular type of testing. To withhold consent from making a particular type of conclusions seems to me to be quite inconsistent with the way we conduct research. And so that sort of, at least on the initial pass, and I haven't really thought that deeply about it, but on the initial pass, I think that seems to me to be somewhat problematic. So along with the notion that the federal government's policy right now is toward Native communities is one of self-determination. They define who they are and how they exist. I think that you have to talk, again, about identity and that individuals identify as tribal members, but they also identify in terms of a larger group and a larger community. And I think that in this question of origin stories and where people are from, again, there's a parallel to 
my universe of a lot of the BRCA mutations are attributed to certain geographical areas. Okay, you hear a lot about the three Ashkenazi Jewish mutations. Okay, is there, the geographic area is basically middle of Germany and Poland with today's geographics. Okay, does that mean that there is something inherent in a person that makes them Ashkenazi? Or does it mean that there is genetic, genetic material in their greater genome that identifies a group as Ashkenazi? But does that person identify as Ashkenazi? I mean, there are just there's so many implications about identity and who you are and where you come from. There is a, a French Canadian mutation. There are mutations that are isolated to some of the Caribbean islands. There are mutations that are isolated to single families. That's very detailed. And I think in a country and in a day and age where people's origins and actual blood, let's not forget that we live in a country where the, the one drop rule existed at one point, which meant if you have one drop of a black in you, you are black, not white. That's disturbing. And that was a way to bolster racism in this country. So again, I think you have to very gingerly deal with the concept of identity in indigenous populations because they are allowed and they are permitted and they should be able to determine their own identities as they pursue their sovereign rights. Could I just, I just wanted to follow up and just say, I, I agree with that entirely. And I think it comes back to what Julia was saying in the beginning. That it's about power, right? And this is one of the, it's a, a not subtle thing in the relationship of tribes to researchers. When you get to a conflict between the tribe's understanding of its origins and the researchers coming in and saying, we're going to say where you're from. This is about power and potential oppression, right? That somebody who is not you, let's just say who you are um, or not, <laughs> right? And so it is that kind of a social struggle. And we need to recognize it as that kind of a social struggle. Um, and this is part of why I personally am very interested in the idea that both stories could be right in some way. Uh, but I, I think we need to recognize it on that level as it's a matter of power and oppression, potentially. And, um, now, I was, a, I was billed as, on this panel as somebody who will talk about it, individual medicine, and I have it, but here's my chance. <laughs> um, and here's where I guess I disagree in terms of the issue of self-identification versus let's call it for lack of a better word for now, genetic identification, identification by, uh, you know, scientific method, whether or not you, you know, buy into the full uh, science behind it. So there were studies, I think, again, I'm not remembering the date, but mid-90s, basically, um, as to how African Americans versus whites react to various uh, heart, uh, blood pressure medication. And there's been lots of debates in those studies whether they were properly done or, you know. But one of the earlier ones that reported a difference between how blacks and whites react to blood pressure medication um, selected its African-American population by self-identification. So you, they sort of asked, well, do you identify yourself as black? Um, and then once they did that, you know, they got some sort of results. And, Without getting into sort of the discussion whether or not those were valid or invalid results, it seems to me that if you are actually trying to develop a regimen to treat people for high blood pressure, to develop, and to the extent that there are, in fact, I mean, maybe there aren't, but to the extent that there are some sort of genetic differences that would affect which pills you should be taking, it seems to me that classifying people based on their self identification sort of defeats that purpose. Now, again, it may very well be that there are no differences that to speak of. And, you know, everybody should be taking the same pill regimen given the same, you know, level of blood pressure or other uh, 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 comorbid conditions. 
But if there are, it seems somewhat odd to me to to do it based on sort of the way you perceive yourself in the world as opposed to based on your genetic makeup that, that causes you to have that sort of blood pressure. So I just have to respond to this um, because, first of all, the NIH guidelines and um, requirements basically for researchers with respect to collecting data on race and ethnicity um, are that you collect data by self-identification. Okay. That, but that's different than what is somebody's genotype. And so I think that's where we need to make the distinction that it is possible that within any particular group, whether that group is defined by a village from which they came, a country from which they came, or a racial or ethnic identification, that some people, that, that the um, percentage of genetic variants that might uh, predispose somebody to respond well to a medication or not would be slightly different in particular groups, no matter how defined, right? So there are two separate questions. One is a question of identity, and another is a question of what is the, uh, the ratio of genotypes within any group of people, howsoever defined. Um, and so when people are doing genetics research, they still use self-identity uh, with respect to any kind of grouping, and they use lots of different kinds of groupings. And then also, they look at overall genetic similarity and difference uh, when they're analyzing their data completely separate from identity. Uh, and it may be that and in fact, it's been recommended that for some kinds of medications where we understand well what genotypes um, cause people to not even respond to a drug, so certain kinds of drugs, if your body can't metabolize it, you won't really respond to it. Um, drugs like warfarin uh, that is used for uh, blood thinning, basically, we know a lot about a couple of genes where the different variants that you have will influence how well you metabolize it and what um, therapeutic dose you will achieve. Um, so it's been recommended that people be genetically tested to know wh what variants you have to help determine your dose. But that's at the individual level because knowing what even knowing your ancestry generally as defined by genetics um, is not going to say for sure what variant you individually have. So there's a distinction, I think, between understanding somebody's personal genetic makeup in order to determine their health care versus a person's identity. And who gets to say what a person's identity is, right? Whether it's scientists or whether it's the person or the tribe or whatever. Well, we are definitely running up against uh, lunchtime and probably a little bit into it. I mean, we can probably take one question from the audience if anybody uh, wants to postpone lunch or, or that. Okay, go ahead, please. I only have one comment, okay. and that's the source of authority in speaking to both Greg and Ezra. If you look at international documents, the Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Article 3 says Indigenous peoples have the right to self determination. That's basic. International human rights. Who determines? It is the Indigenous people who determine self. So I, I just can't help myself, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so this actually raises a point that I, I can't remember who said this, um, but it had to do with, you know, scientists going to maybe a big healthcare provider in a city and studying Indians in the city even after, so where they're not within the jurisdiction of the tribe and they're not coming onto the reservation. Um, and, and there's actually been a lot of discussion about 
this, even among scientists. There are many scientists who say, well, if the tribe tells me no, I wouldn't go into the city and do that study because basically you're poisoning the well, right? You, as a scientist, may know that then you are creating ill will towards not only yourself but towards other researchers as well. And people of goodwill generally don't want to do that. But there are also other ways of dealing with this, one of which has to kind of do with self-determination and identity, which is that the scientists might negotiate with the tribe that if, they, if the tribe doesn't want to participate, then the scientist is going to go and study people in a healthcare environment in the city, that they can do that, but what they can't do is then use the tribe's name in claims that they're making, which is actually all the more reasonable because they are probably studying many different Indians from many different tribes. Um, and so it's both scientifically reasonable, but it's also respectful um, of the tribe's self-determination. I more or less agree. Yeah. <laughs> I guess my point was, and I, I was the one who was making it, was uh, not so much that scientists necessarily is trying to go behind the tribe's back, but my question or comment or I guess skepticism, however you want to phrase it, was that whether or not, and I, you know, I, I, I take the point that tribes are sovereign and it's not just the elders, it's the tribal government. So, but the question is how far does that sovereignty and the, the government authority extend to each individual person? So not so much the scientists going behind the back, but one of the tribal members saying, you know what, I just disagree. And I think they should have been let on our land. And so, you know, I'm just not going to follow it. And I'm going to walk, do that eight mile hike off the road. And I'm going to, to get my blood or my hair or whatever sample that they get, right? And so my question was in this battle with the individual and, uh, and the community as to how much control and who has it. And I tend to err on the side of the individual. Yeah, this is uh, Eric Wilson here, Interior Department. Just a quick comment. Uh, maybe we often deal with uh, trees, rocks, and people in that order. <laughs> um, but so, so I'm going to make a pitch for I'm going to make a pitch for the, the, the you know the idea here that you know there there are many moral and ethical questions raised being raised about the human genetic uh, you know aspect here, but. Um, please uh, do, and perhaps the next uh, uh, panel will we'll focus on this as well, the importance of biological diversity and the genetics that are associated with, with the natural world. Um, and that's, that's very important to the spiritual and, and cultural uh, uh, dimensions of, uh, of tribes of people. And so it, it, it certainly respect the, you know, the, the, the dilemma that medicine has in, in terms of uh, genetic resources. That, that cannot be the last word on genetics. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, well, I think lunch is waiting for us out that way. So lunch is set up immediately behind this room just outside. But the plan is to get lunch, then come back here and eat here. Eat here, right. OK, great. Well, thank you. And thanks to this panel for the great <laughs>